How far should a man go in his quest to spread the word of God? Just how righteous can a leader claim to be when thousands are slaughtered at his sole command? Could the killing of those who refuse a king's demands to abandon their religion and convert ever be justified? Or are such actions motivated more by personal power and prestige than holy piety? The Frankish king Charlemagne was a man who forged a reputation as one of the greatest leaders in European history. However, like all great men through the ages, his achievements were won at the point of a sword and secured with the threat of violence against any who might dare to challenge his position and authority. Yet of all the suffering unleashed by his reign, it would be Charlemagne's merciless beheading of 4,500 Saxons at Verdun in 782 AD that would forever tarnish the reputation of the man credited with re-establishing Western Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire, as in retribution for the rebellion and religious defiance, the noble piety of the King of the Franks gave way to base revenge, as no matter how just one might wish to be, in a world where strength is prized above all else, disobedience cannot go unanswered. When Charlemagne ascended to the Frankish throne in 768 AD, the former territories of the once mighty Western Roman Empire had already endured centuries of decline and fragmentation. Tribes and kingdoms raided and plundered their neighbours, while Christians, Muslims and pagans fought bitterly for their respective gods. It was against this violent and chaotic backdrop that the young King Charlemagne set about building a new Western European empire, one that he hoped might rival or even surpass Rome in its glory and power. However, achieving such a grand ambition would require immeasurable blood, sacrifice, wisdom and treasure. Determined to pull Western Europe out of its post-Roman malaise, Charlemagne quickly embarked upon a series of brilliant military campaigns that saw his armies waging war from Spain to Italy, each new victory in battle both expanding his kingdom as well as his own personal power and legend. His 46-year-long reign would be one of almost continuous warfare, yet despite ultimately securing his place in the history books as the man who restored order and civilization to Europe after the traumatic fall of the Roman Empire, the wise and just king, who is widely credited with laying the foundations of modern Europe, would demonstrate a far darker side during his campaign against the Saxons of northwest Germany, a clash of diametrically opposed cultures and religions that would prove to be the longest and most difficult war of his life. The Franks and Saxons had long been adversaries, however their rivalry had usually been limited to small-scale raids and skirmishes fought along the border, yet the campaign undertaken by Charlemagne in 772 would irreversibly intensify the situation, escalating what was a relatively minor conflict into a full-scale war of conquest, as Charlemagne sought to not only win territory for his new empire, but also souls for his god. While the Franks had already converted to Christianity, the pagan Saxons stubbornly held on to their old traditions and customs, refusing to abandon the old gods, no matter how many missionaries arrived from Rome. In the new world being built, such defiance could not be tolerated. By the book or the sword, the word of the Christian god would be spread. The troublesome Saxons would be brought to heel. As Charlemagne crossed into Saxony at the beginning of 772, he most likely expected a quick and decisive campaign that would result in his enemies' subjugation and conversion. However, little did he know that 33 years of war and rebellion awaited him. The first campaign appeared to be a convincing success, with the Franks destroying several strategic Saxon strongholds, rapidly securing the submission of numerous tribes, and carting off a fortune in plundered gold and silver. However, this invasion was not to be one solely concerned with land and riches. As part of his plan to cleanse the Saxon people of all vestiges of the old ways by removing all symbols of the heathen religion, Charlemagne ordered the destruction and looting of the Erminsul, a sacred tree that was widely venerated by the pagan Saxons and a holy site that had likely been worshipped for generations, a highly inflammatory move which almost certainly strengthened the Saxon desire to resist. 
With negotiations complete, hostages taken, and submissions accepted, Charlemagne believed himself free to turn his attention elsewhere, immediately marching on the Lombards of northern Italy. However, a disgruntled Saxon noble named Widdicund incited a revolt not long after the Franks had departed, leading his warbands across the Rhine on raids deep into Frankish territory. Widukind proved to be a competent, highly resilient, and charismatic leader, capable of winning over large numbers of Saxons to his cause, and skillfully using his limited forces to carry out devastating attacks upon strategic targets, before slipping away into the dense forests at the first sign of any significant Frankish retaliation. It soon became clear that there would be no easy and lasting victory over the Saxons, and for the next ten years a cycle of violence and rebellion emerged, whereby Charlemagne would return north to subdue a new Saxon rebellion, defeat them in battle, baptise the local tribes, take hostages and tribute, and secure treaties of submission, only for new rebellions to break out as soon as he had gone home. Charlemagne grew increasingly frustrated with Widukind and the Saxons, a people whom he now viewed as dishonourable oathbreakers, who thought nothing of going back on their word and reneging on treaties. However, the Saxons were not a single tribe ruled by one king. Securing the submission of one tribe did not mean that all Saxon lands had been subjugated. No one man could claim to speak for all of the Saxon people, and against a backdrop of ever-shifting tribal loyalties and alliances, any deals struck with one leader would rarely be worth the paper they were written on. However, 782 AD would be a year that changed everything. Ten years after the first Frankish invasion, Widukind again incited rebellion in response to a new and severe code of law imposed on the Saxons by Charlemagne that included a list of religious controls which effectively made the practice of paganism punishable by death. The decade-old conflict was once again brought back to life, however this time the Franks were determined to catch the Saxon warlord who had for so long been such a persistent and elusive thorn in their side. Thousands of Saxon warriors flocked to a rebel fortress under construction in the Sundhelm Mountains, as Widukind prepared to use his new stronghold as a secure base from which to pillage and plunder enemy settlements and fortresses, as he had done many times before. However, Saxon loyalists betrayed their kin and informed the Franks of Widukind's plans, and a Frankish army that had been planning to engage a nearby tribe of marauding Slavs abandoned the original mission and hastily marched on the Saxon fortress in the mountains. This combined force of Franks was under the leadership of four nobles, who were supposedly equal in rank, the commanders formulating a plan to attack as one and destroy the Saxons in a pincer attack on the enemy fortress that would trap Widukind and provide a final and decisive victory over their old adversary. However, one of the nobles, Count Theodoric, appeared to be becoming far too comfortable issuing orders to the others, the man no doubt confident that as cousin to the great Charlemagne, his word held more weight than that of his three colleagues. The original plan required a vanguard of Franks to march forward and scout out the enemy position to ensure that the intended pincer attack was feasible. However, the other three commanders were by now convinced that Count Theodoric would reap all of the glory from victory, leaving their own names in his shadow. Determined to secure their place in the history books, the three commanders conspired to launch an attack without Theodoric's involvement, thus winning all of the laurels and prestige that such a victory might bring. Believing that the barbarian Saxons would prove to be no match for the massed heavy cavalry, the Frankish commanders agreed not to risk alerting the Saxons to their presence with any attempt at reconnaissance, instead deciding to launch their offensive directly into the unknown fog of war that awaited them ahead. Instead of carrying out a unified and organised pincer attack on the Saxons, the Frankish cavalry impetuously charged forward without infantry support in an almost manic and disorganised rabble, as though the battle was a foregone conclusion and victory had already been secured. 
with thoughts of glory and fame clouding the vision of the overconfident Franks. The sight of Widukin's infantry eventually came into view. The Saxons already lined up in battle formation, with the fort's walls at their backs, protecting the rear from the more mobile Frankish cavalry. Standing shoulder to shoulder, with their spears braced for impact, the Saxons prepared to receive the charge of their hated foes, which sporadically crashed into the spear wall, horse by horse, rather than connecting as one body, greatly diminishing the shock power of the attack. With the horses impaled upon long, fierce spears, the surviving dismounted Franks were quickly surrounded and all but wiped out, fighting to the death as they were stabbed and hacked to pieces by the vengeful Saxons. Envy and jealousy amongst the Frankish leadership had turned what should have been a straightforward victory for their superior army into a complete disaster, one that resulted in the death of thousands of sorely needed cavalry, two envoys, four counts, and twenty nobles, many of whom were relatives, powerful allies, and close friends of Charlemagne himself, this single battle gutting the Frankish leadership and military elite. Upon hearing of the calamity that had befallen his army, Charlemagne hastily gathered a huge army and marched for Verdun, determined to bring to justice all those responsible for the treacherous rebellion and humiliating slaughter of his men. With such a terrifying force entering their lands, many of the Saxons realised the folly of continuing the rebellion any further, and when Charlemagne called all of the Saxon chiefs to assemble before him, most obeyed, aware that the Frankish king would hunt down and put to death any who refused. In an effort to dampen Charlemagne's fury, the Saxon chieftains freely offered up the 4,500 warriors who had partaken in the rebellion, however the leader Widukind had already fled to Denmark to escape the king's justice, leaving his men to face their fate alone. With the eyes of his enemies and his allies upon him, Charlemagne knew that mercy would almost certainly be interpreted as weakness, and with the 4,500 prisoners assembled before him at Verdun, he ordered that the heads be removed, the grisly executions carried out in a single day, with the nearby river reported to have run red with blood due to the sheer number of decapitations that took place. While the punishment handed out that day might seem unnecessarily cruel and savage to the modern mind, judged by the standards of the day, there could be no other response to such public defiance and disobedience. With his reputation on the line, Charlemagne had to act decisively and ruthlessly, lest his enemies be emboldened by his lenience, or his own nobles begin to doubt his authority and willingness to punish the guilty. To the Franks, as the Saxons had earlier sworn allegiance to Charlemagne, the rebellion was deemed to be an act of treason, a crime punishable by death, the sentence traditionally carried out by beheading the guilty, thus making the massacre that day perfectly legal under Frankish law. In addition to treason, the rebels had also killed some of the king's closest companions and counsellors, men with whom he had shared his tent and hall, the loss of whom would have no doubt been felt bitterly by Charlemagne. As the liege lord, he owed the fallen their vengeance, and could not shy away from his debt to the dead. Yet if Charlemagne hoped his stern action that day would intimidate the surviving Saxons into meek submission, he would be sorely mistaken, as years of rebellions and fighting lay ahead, and although his nemesis Widukind eventually submitted three years later, in 785, when he agreed to be baptised into the Christian faith, a ceremony at which Charlemagne became his godfather, the wars would continue until the last rebellion in 804, more than 30 years after Charlemagne's first campaign against the Saxons, the unruly tribes finally agreeing to renounce their traditions and faith, and accept Christianity and incorporation into the Frankish Empire. I hope you enjoyed the video, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you again soon.